this week we're talking about phytoplasmas and mistletoe. So they re phytoplasma resemble bacteria in shape and size as well as properties. They have a cell membrane, but they don't have a cell wall. And they are located primarily in the phloem, so that can interfere with the translocation of sugars. So that can inhibit growth and uh, cause issues elsewhere. So some of the symptoms you might see are yellowing or reddening of leaves. You can see in the bottom picture here we've got some reddening of leaves and uh, yellows diseases, yellowing of youngest leaves spreading to older leaves. Um, I'm going to be talking about aster yellows, but uh, one real big problem on the east coast is ash yellows and those trees are already under uh, attack by emerald ash borer, so it's pretty devastating for ash trees. Stunting, break of bud, dormancy, and witch's brooms, which you can see in the upper picture here. So other symptoms include fasciation, which you can see here on maple. You have a change from floral to sterile leaf type structures and flowers. You may see an ex excessive proliferation of stems and, and or roots, swelling of buds or stems, and decline and or death of the plant. So here's tissue proliferation in rhododendron. You wouldn't even know this is a rhododendron, would you? Okay, these are Asiatic lilies that are actually outside of the greenhouse, and this is from last year. Those of you that were on campus a couple weeks ago saw either evidence or the actual leafhopper pest on these uh, lilies. They weren't showing fasciation at that point, um, but you can see the leaves here below the fasciation have leafhopper damage on them, so totally spread through leafhoppers. Here's another picture from that from last year, that broad flattened stem of the lily. Here's some symptoms of aster yellows on echinacea. So one of the most common sy symptoms is virescence, and that's normally colored plant parts, such as flowers, are green in color. So this cone flower has that. It also is showing brooming. So phytoplasmas are spread through budding, grafting, or cutting. They can spread through natural root grafts, and they are spread by insects, especially leafhoppers, possibly aphids and daughter, the parasitic plant, can actually spread it from one plant to another. So it's important to manage leafhoppers, not an easy thing to do. Uh, you want to rogue out infected plants, manage your weeds that may be harboring phytoplasma, so things like dandelions actually can harbor phytoplasma. You want to disinfect your pruning equipment. And I just wanted to pop these pictures in here. This is from a thing I've shared with you on Canvas. These are leafhopper vectors of Western X, which affect cherries and peaches and some of the other rose family fruits. And uh, there's a real variety of what they look like, but they are all transmitters of this phytoplasma. So one way you can manage leafhoppers can be Encouraging natural enemies, parasitic wasps, predator bugs. Here we have minute pirate bug, which is actually feeding on thrips here, but definitely a predator of leafhoppers, lacewings, predator mites, and spiders. Still pretty challenging. Um, they move very quickly. Hosing will work to some extent, but that's only if you're working with wingless nymphs. They, they almost laugh at you when you try to hose them off the plants. Okay, aster yellows. This is a phytoplasma transmitted by the aster leafhopper. The leaves are yellow. You get abnormal branching, and then you get this yellow leaf-like tissue instead of floral parts, and this is cosmos. So aster yellows can affect some 300 species, and many of them are in the asteraceae, but as you can see, we've got some things listed here in other families, so it's not just aster family. But if you do know you have it in the area, plants that may be less susceptible include Nicotiana, Geranium, Salvia, Impatience, Portulaca, and Verbena. 
Here's what it looks like on lettuce. Now you may think that this may be a deficiency, but uh, this is actually the damage on lettuce. Here's what it looks like on Black-Eyed Susan. Here's what it looks on, like on potatoes. So as I said, other families are affected by this. And this is the aster leaf hopper. So on the right we've got the adult, on the left we've got the wingless nymph. So that would be when you need to try to manage it. And they are out pretty early in the season. Um, I've had them for weeks, not necessarily aster leaf hopper, but I've had leaf hoppers for weeks in my garden. Okay, mistletoe. So in this case we're talking about hemlock dwarf mistletoe. This is a leafless flowering plant. It's an endophyte system, so it gets inside the plant. Um, so that's the modified roots. They have aerial shoots, which are the reproductive portion, and they are obligate parasites, meaning they need to have something that they're going to parasitize to survive. So the endophytic portions that get inside the trees uh, function as feeding structures. They're embedded in the cambium or sapwood of the host, tree twigs, branches, or trunks. And then the outer structure, the portion outside of the plant, are the male and female structures. So on the left we've got the fruit of the female plants, and on the right we have the male plants. Here we have it on hemlock. Here's the damage. So managing this is by removing all plants by harvesting or pruning. This would be mid to late summer. Aerial shoots will regrow unless the entire branch is move, removed. So if you are going to try to remove it, you're going to want to take that whole branch and hopefully it's well behind the damage that you see.